record on this computer. All right, we're recording. So good morning and welcome everybody to the part two of three sessions on integrated pest management uh, with our uh, faculty here, Susanna Reese at Cornell University and uh, Stop Pests. So we're, we're so appreciative for her expertise. I was hoping David Kelly could join us too. I reminded him about that. Um, uh, but I know he took a little trip this week, I think. So I don't know if he's still on vacation. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, I thought maybe what we could do, Suzanne, if you want to start off, introduce yourself. There are a couple people I think that are new today. And then we'll just uh, go around the rest of us and introduce ourselves and talk about maybe the, the scope of, of, of how we work in, in this area. So go ahead, Suzanne. Okay. So thanks for having me again. Um, I work at Cornell University, but I have a grant from HUD to provide training and technical assistance on integrated pest management. And um, as you know, I focus on the main pests of housing, rodents, bed bugs, and cockroaches. Um, normally I go around and I train in person. So unfortunately <laughs> with COVID, I've had to do a lot more online and it's a little more challenging, but I'm grateful that we have the technology. Yeah, usually we're, we're losing out because from what I understand, you have free giveaways usually at in-person training, so. <laughs> yeah, maybe um, I could send you guys a package and if there's one central, like I could send a package of the giveaways to Colleen and then you just have them. And if you see people, you see people and you, right. but I can do that. I'm, right. I'll be in the office uh, on and off this week and next week. So maybe we'll talk about that. Okay, sounds good. All right, so I'm just gonna, um, uh, just to reintroduce, I didn't really introduce myself, Colleen Loveless and the president at Revitalize Community Development Corporation. And we are working with a lot of the healthcare systems in Western Massachusetts, especially on asthma uh, programs, interventions and repairs and remediation of asthma triggers in the homes and, um, and uh, rental units and buildings. And uh, we've been doing that for about four or five years now. And uh, so the next one on the list uh, that I see in front of me in the order here is Carolina. So go ahead, Carolina. Hello, good morning. Um, my name is Carolina. I work for Holy Medical Center as a certified community health worker for community navigation. And uh, we work with uh, patients who has asthma, but we also work with other interventions as well. Okay, great. And is Elmer gonna join us too? I thought I saw him earlier. He's he's there. Okay, he's listening. <laughs> okay. Yeah, <I'm> <laughs> All right. I'll... He's not joining. He okay. has other something else to do. Gotcha. Okay. So again, morning, like morning everybody. Morning, CJ. Go ahead, CJ. Want to introduce yourself since you? I'm sorry for the delay. I'm CJ Hanley from CET, and I do the healthy home evaluations for. Um, Springfield Revitalize and now Holyoke. And I also do a lot of energy assessments for utility programs. Nice to meet you. Thanks, DJ. Okay, next one I have is Rachel. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Rachel. Um, I work at Revitalize CDC. I'm the program coordinator and uh, sometimes healthy homes assessor. <laughs> and then Ethel. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ethel Griffin. I'm the di director of program at Revitalize CDC. Good morning. And next we have is Kara. Um, hi, I'm Kara. I'm also with Revitalize CDC. I'm the COVID-19 program coordinator. Good morning. And then the next person, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, I see your last name is Ruiz. Is your first name pronounced yeah, Yahara? Hello, good morning all. My name is Jahira Ruiz. I'm a um, certified community health worker at Brightwood Health Center. So Jahara, is that correct? Is that how you pronounce? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Thanks for good morning. joining us. And thank then you. We, and then we have Carla Garcia. Carla, can you hear us? You're off mute. I think Carla is with Bay State, one of the accountable care organizations, I think. Okay, Carla, if you wanted to, oh, she put it in the chat. Yeah, having issues with audio. Oh, Hopefully okay. she can hear. 
<laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> Welcome. All right, I turn the floor over to you there, Susanna. Okay, so the presentations are being recorded by Colleen. So if you um, want to share them later with colleagues, you can do that. I'm going to try to share my screen. We just had one other person just join us. Oh, and while um, I'm, you have to enable me to share my screen. Oh, that's right. Okay. Um, they just changed this in Zoom. Yeah, hold on. But we just had, uh, so Carla's also, she said she's a CHW for Bay State Medical Center. And then okay. we just had uh, someone by the last name Oliver join us. If you want to introduce yourself. You're on mute. They're just probably getting settled in. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sonia Oliver, a community health worker from the th th earlier intervention program. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Great. Okay, so we established we're going to talk about uh, bed bugs today. And my understanding is I should probably focus on personal protection, and then if you're advocating for clients or patients, you probably want to know what techniques work the best for um, bed bugs. So uh, I'll try to breeze through the intro stuff um, pretty fast because I'm assuming at this point, most people are familiar with what bed bugs look like um, and their habits. You know, they've been around since early 2000s and uh, we're at this point, if you work in housing, you've probably seen them. Um, again, I always have to thank my sponsors. Uh, the materials you will see today have been developed by all these wonderful agencies. And I'm going to, you're going to see pictures of products, and I'm not endorsing those products. Um, I can give you advice on products that uh, have been tested and researched. Um, but uh, I'm using the products you see on the slides for illustrative purposes. So Colleen and I talked about setting up a poll and I'm just curious, um, you know, if, if you can't get the poll to work, there's a small enough group, unmute yourself and give us your um, uh, answer. The, you can answer the poll live, but if Colleen could pull up the poll, we're curious how often you see signs of bed bug infestations in the homes you work in, or maybe if you only see patients um, or clients outside of their homes, how many, how often do you see clients with, uh, with, uh, oh, <laughs> this is the poll from last week. <laughs> I know, you gotta go down to, I know, it, but it's so weird here. I'm sorry. Here, it's number three. Okay, okay so, so. Are I you able to, I know. See that, can we, how often do you see signs? Number, question oh. number three. I just see the ones from last week. If anyone else is seeing a different poll, please fill it in. Oh, wow. Into number three, and yeah, if you three. scroll down to number question number three, uh, um, we I I just never, see burdens. I put never, but I can't submit it. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's from last week. It says rodents. Okay, so um, how often, how about um, we try just... Um, Wait, let me try to do it on the fly. Let me see if I can, no, and let me do the end poll. Uh, relaunch. How about you, you can write in the chat how often you see you um, signs of bed bug infestations, frequently, sometimes, rarely, or never. How big of a concern is it to you? And we'll we'll get we'll circle back. I'll look at the, the chat, and I'm going to keep talking. So last uh, week I talked about IPM, Integrated Pest Management, and I said I showed you the picture of the stool, and I said the whole basic concept is we got to eliminate the food, water, and shelter of these pests, and that's the basic premise behind IPM. But what about bed bugs? Can you remove the food, water, and shelter from from bed bugs? We are their food, so we can't eliminate ourselves from our homes. 
they don't drink water. They get all their fluids that they need from blood and we are their shelter. So they don't live outside um, like some cockroaches or rodents. They wander in from outside. Bed bugs only uh, live inside. They cannot survive outside. They originally started out in caves as pests of bats and then they moved their way down the <laughs> down the cave to the humans. So there we go. There's our bed bugs. They just made their home on that stool. So uh, the concept of IPM for bed bugs really has to focus on the inspection and monitoring and using multiple tools. So I showed you this little life cycle last time. We want to inspect and monitor, identify, scale the response, use multiple tools, evaluate success, and inspect and monitor. The evaluate success stuff um, uh, process is really important with bed bugs because I constantly see the same home being treated and treated and treated over and over and no one's saying hey this isn't working we got to try something else so you got to be aware that bed bugs can be killed we know how to kill them and if treatments are going on for months weeks months let's say months then something's going wrong. So I'm going to talk about what they are, what they eat, where they live very briefly, uh, how to think like a bed bug, <laughs> uh, prevention, monitoring, assessment based control. But um, I, and I'm also going to talk about personal protection. So let me keep going. We know that bed bugs suck blood. They're flat. They can be a sesame seed to an apple seed. Color varies. Uh, why are they back? Well, there's a lot of changes in pesticide availability. Um, some very good reasons that some pesticides are off the market now. Um, changes in our pesticide use, that uh, could be related to, we used to spray down uh, apartments and homes with uh, all sorts of chemicals and that kept the bed bugs at bay. Um, but now say for cockroaches, we're using more baits. So we're not spraying around as many chemicals, but that's a minor um, reason. There's more travel and mobility, more infested locations. At first, when bed bugs were first introduced back into the U.S., it was mainly a problem in higher end hotels because those are the people that could afford to travel internationally. And within a few years, oh, and also military bases because those folks were, were traveling internationally. Bed bugs never really went away in other countries. They did, we think that they went away in the U.S., but um, because of the travel and mobility and their existence in other areas of the world, uh, they were reintroduced. So we have more infestations and more infestations mean more bed bugs. The other thing is I can remember um, my first bed bug sample coming into my office way back in 2006 and I had no idea what it was. I had to, you know, I looked it up and I thought, oh, it must be a bat bug because I didn't think we had bed bugs and they look very similar. Anyway, what I found was we were unprepared for bed bugs to come back and we didn't have controls and pest control companies didn't even know what to spray for bed bugs. We didn't have any products that were labeled for bed bugs. So while we kind of figured out what was going on, uh, entomologists and pest control companies were trying to figure it out, the bed bugs just kept reproducing. And then they became problems of uh, lower income people in high rise buildings because the their ability to spread. Um, and then a big uh, reason why we, there's such a problem is pesticide resistance. A lot of people say, oh, bring back DDT. Bed bugs were already resistant to DDT before it was taken off the market. So it wouldn't be a solution. Um, DDT Tea was very widely used, as this poster shows you from back from the 50s. People just sprayed it everywhere. Um, the problem with DDT wasn't so much the human health consequences, but the environmental health consequences. So it's a good thing it was taken off the market, and it is not the answer for bed bugs because they were already resistant to it. So what is resistance? That means the more we spray a chemical on a bug, the more they evolve to resist dying from it. So we spray um, raid on bed bugs and the next uh, one survives, the next time and that one that survives reproduces, the next time you spray, you have to spray more of the product to kill the same amount of bed bugs, but those ones with the resistant gene will keep reproducing until you have an entire population of resistant uh, bugs and it takes more chemical to kill those resistant bugs or it takes changing the chemical to kill those resistant bugs. And that happens for every bug. There's nothing that we can throw at them that they won't evolve. They are, they're amazing. <laughs> 
Uh, bed bugs are a pest of public health significance. As you know, they used to be a public health threat, but then they got downgraded, and that means less federal funding, unfortunately. But um, uh, they do have significant health consequences, as you all know. Uh, they can result in stress, loss of work, productivity, sleep. Your kid can't go to school if they, um, if they have bed bugs. There's a financial burden. It's very expensive to get rid of bed bugs. Uh, people that in rural areas, especially that own their own homes, I've visited a lot of trailers out in the sticks with bed bugs, and there is just very few options for people um, uh, in those situations because it's so expensive. Uh, you can get secondary infections from scratching the bites. This is especially a, a big deal with people with diabetes. We see uh, bites getting infected and secondary infections. They're unwelcome. They do not transmit diseases under normal living conditions. In the lab, you can make them uh, transmit Chagas disease, but that's not a concern for us until we have evidence, real evidence of them spreading disease. They cannot spread COVID either. I think that's been looked into as well. Um, but there is new evidence that bed bugs can uh, trigger asthma and allergies, just like cockroaches and rodents. So we should be aware of that, especially in the homes where there are um, people suffering from asthma. So a female lays less than 200 eggs in a lifetime, one to five eggs a day. They travel around the room laying an egg here and there. So that's what makes them scatter and harder to control because they're always on the move. It takes about five weeks. They can live for five weeks to four months, just depends on how often they feed and reproduce. They have five nymphal stages. As you can see the picture on the right, that means they shed their skin five times and they have to feed before they shed their skin. Say you have a tiny little bed bug like on the left here and it never gets a blood meal, it will never reproduce because it will never mature to the reproductive stage. So that comes in handy when we're trying to control them. And uh, just a quick picture so you can see they look really different from the, the different life cycles look different when they're fed and when they're not recently fed. I'm sorry for those that are grossed out by these pictures. Sometimes when you work with bed bugs, you get desensitized to it. And I don't even think about how gross this is for some people, but apologies. There's more to come. <laughs> this is kind of uh, gross too, sorry. Um, but I just wanted to illustrate that they do look different after they've fed. So sometimes you can mistake them for different, uh, different pests because you're not familiar with what they look like after they've fed, which is looks like could, could be a completely different bug. Um, I, I know this picture isn't clear, but I just wanted to use it to illustrate how many can fit in a screw hole. So they like to hide. They're most active at night. This is where they spend their day in that screw hole that was in a bed frame. They hide in cracks and crevices, so it's often hard to see them, and we don't see them until the infestation gets really bad. They're often in groups, they congregate in groups, they like to hang out together, it conserves water actually. And they cannot fly, jump or burrow into your skin, they can just crawl. But if you've seen them crawling, they can get, they can go pretty fast. The biggest way they travel is just hitchhiking on coats, bags, furniture and, and wheelchairs. They only eat blood. Often they're very, they're confused with these other pests. Um, the most often, pest I think that's confused with bed bugs are carpet beetles and the carpet beetle larva um, because they're often in the same places. They're on sofas and, and couches and they're eating the fiber, um, but bed bugs, uh, they, yeah. And, and people can often have re allergic reactions to carpet beetles and the larva. So it's very confusing. So that's why we want correct identification. I've had a lot of people who overreacted to carpet beetles um, and paid for bed bug service when they did not need to. Uh, there's something else called a bat bug and there's a tropical bed bug. So there's a, a couple other species that are similar and they do they feed on us just as well as bed bugs. But um, for example, if you had a bat bug infestation, you'd probably have to take care of the, the bat infestation in the attic as well. So if you're working in old houses and inspecting old houses and uh, there's bats, this is a pest, bat bugs are a pest that come along with, with bats. So the signs of bed bugs, and I think most of you who have worked in homes, you're probably familiar with it. The first sign we often see, the often like the first clue that there's an infestation are the bites, but you cannot diagnose an infestation from the bites alone. Um, 
certainly I've been in many apartments and when I come out itchy, it is almost 99% um, of the time it's the apartment was infested with fleas. So we can't say, you know, for sure what the bites are. If a doctor tells you, oh yeah, this is a bed bug bite that is um, not reliable because everybody reacts to bug bites in different ways. Some people have a huge reaction. Some people don't react at all to bed bugs. So uh, you really have to find live bed bugs to confirm that there is an infestation. Um, fecal spots, that's the bed bug poop. Um, it looks like someone took a little Sharpie and put little dots on the on that. Um, actually, that's a bed bug uh, encasement. Um, that's the sign we see most often because um, that's the, yeah, that's what they leave behind. They poop out the blood that um, they have consumed. The other thing we see a lot are shed skins. This is really gross. This is an apartment with two elderly people that were in wheelchairs and the guy, the pest control guy just sprayed that, that liquid is a chemical. They just sprayed right on top of that pile of shed skins. Now, remember I, I said they shed their skins five times. They molt five times. That's why we often see the shed skins rather than the live bugs because they're constantly shedding their skins. Now, what happens in this apartment with these elderly people in wheelchairs? How are they going to remove those shed skins? And is that really helpful when the pest control technician just sprays on top of a pile of shed skins? We don't know if the pesticide actually hit the bugs underneath, and we don't know if this is an old infestation or a new infestation. So you'd want to remove those shed skins. Um, if, if the pest control company was doing things properly, we shouldn't see this. So. Um, the guy, the pest control technician looks up at me at, after as he's spraying, he goes, I'll bring my vacuum next time. <laughs> so he knows, and I think most pest control technicians know, but they want to get in and out of an apartment or a home as fast as possible. And sometimes they skip that vacuuming step. Oh, so sorry. Well, that's a little tangent. Oh, we see dead bed bugs. This is an old infestation. Um, I'll just keep moving. And then live bed bugs we sometimes see. If you see live bed bugs crawling around in a home or on somebody, that's a bad infestation. Normally they don't want to be seen. Where do they live? Well, I think we all know they live in inside homes and buildings. There's no bed bug colony outside that's going to come in and, and get into our homes, but they can survive maybe on a mattress that's been thrown out for a few days or weeks if the weather is right. So they can fit in any crack or crevice where a credit card could fit. And that's what we're illustrating with that point behind that um, that wall outlet. And they generally tend to be anywhere near peop where ne people rest, but they can certainly travel away from those areas too, seeking out a new uh, home. How do they spread along wires, pipes, under doors? You can see the outlet picture. We unscrewed that um, plate over the outlet and sure enough, there's the signs of bed bugs. And that means that they were going into that neighboring room or the wall void or the neighboring apartment. So they can come in passively on infested furniture and backpacks. So um, we really discourage picking up furniture from the streets. Um, and being aware of what's on the other side of the wall. So these are the main uh, ways that bed bugs are transported. Picking up furniture, used furniture, and then spreading through, um, through the walls. So sorry for all the wordiness here, but I wanna, uh, now that we know how they're spread, I think it's a good time to talk about how we can prevent bringing them home. Uh, I go into a lot of bed bug infested apartments and I have never brought them home. I, I make a point when I'm doing a presentation and I know that uh, there's pest control technicians in the audience, I always make a point to ask them, have you ever brought bed bugs home? And 90% of the time they say no, because we go through a process and we're careful and you can prevent bringing them home if you have um, a set of, of rules that you follow for yourself. Um, so if you were going into a unit or a home uh, prior to entering, the best thing to do is put on bug spray. They're just like any other bug. They don't want to. They don't want to go near somebody that has on off or even a natural repellent that has citronella in it. You just have to apply it more often. So use insect repellent. I use insect repellent honestly for fleas because I have been in too many apartments and fleas scare me. The the diseases that fleas can spread scare me more than uh, bed bugs scare me. So I use insect repellent when I do home visits. 
Uh, and you have to, you can't just do it one time a day. If you're going to be inspecting apartments or homes all day long, reapply it before you, you know, every couple hours. I think that most sprays only last an hour or two. Avoid sitting or placing items on potentially infested surfaces when you're meeting with clients if in their own homes, meet in the kitchen. Uh, I often have uh, a bunch of equipment that I bring with me or a bag or a box of stuff and I put it right on the kitchen table if I can. I don't put it anywhere near a carpeted surface. I don't put it any on a couch, on a bed. Um, you can wear a protective layer if you have to move furniture. Um, I don't tend to wear a Tyvek suit or encourage people wearing Tyvek suits just to go into an apartment. Um, it's not necessary. If it was an extremely infested apartment, then yes, wear a protective layer over um, the clothes that you're wearing. And then you can just take that off and, and uh, you shouldn't have any issues. Always, I always inspect after I leave an apartment, uh, the shoes and the cuffs of your clothes are the most common places where you might pick them up. So check your shoes out really thoroughly. I've already sprayed my shoes, so I, but I still inspect them because if I'm not sitting down in an apartment, they can't crawl up on my clothes. But um, when I'm inspecting, I, I inevitably like touch things that I shouldn't, you know, up against a furniture when I'm inspecting. So I try not to sit down on anything. Uh, but if you're not sitting down on anything, my point is the shoes. Check your shoes. Um, you can use an extra sticky lint uh, roller to inspect yourself. I just kind of run it along my whole body and see what comes off. But you can also use uh, the extra sticky lint rollers to inspect furniture as well. Say used furniture or if you're an inspector going into a home and you want to know if there's bed bugs and you don't want to get that intimate with, <laughs> with the furniture, um, you can use a lint roller. And then if there are bed bugs or eggs, they get stuck to that sticky uh, paper and they're not crawling. Um, if I'm spending a full day inspecting apartments or traveling along with a pest control company, I change my clothes before I go back into my house. Or if I can't do that, or if I'm staying at a hotel or whatnot, I go into the bathroom and I change my clothes in the bathtub. That way, if anything fell off me, it would be in the bathtub. And bed bugs are not great climbers. They're not gonna be able to uh, climb up out of most tubs, depending on the surface. Okay, and then when I take my clothes off, I bag them up, double bag them right away, or they go right into the washing machine. You can also just put them straight into the dryer. High heat kills bed bugs. So in your offices, in your community areas where you're working, and if you have clients coming in, uh, my previous job, I did have this um, happen where people brought in insect samples, and more and more often they were bringing in bed bugs. So um, I would vacuum after they left and that was essentially all I did. And um, I think that's a really good control. And then I took the contents of the vacuum and I emptied them outside. So essentially when people were coming in, there was one chair that they sat in and that's the chair that I focused on um, around and on the chair, making sure I was vacuuming after people left. Um, in your offices and community areas where clients might be gathering or waiting. If you're replacing furniture, you might want to avoid fabric covered furniture and go with a plastic or metal or at least furniture that has less cracks and crevices and would be easier to, um, to uh, inspect. Susanna, um, I just wanted to read a question in the chat from Carla. Um, oh, yeah. She said, I was told in the past if conducting home visits spraying, rubbing alcohol on shoes, pants, et cetera, helps them keep them away. Is this true? Oh, I'm so glad you mentioned that. No, it's not. Oh my gosh. I, I, I am so relieved you mentioned that because it's usually in my presentation, but not in this one. Uh, so alcohol, the way rubbing alcohol works is if you drown a bed bug in rubbing alcohol, yes, it will kill it. But if you just spray your pants, it's not a repellent off or any kind of insect repellent would work better than rubbing alcohol. Rubbing alcohol is a contact spray. So when you've sprayed your shoes, you sprayed your pants, you're nothing really but a fire hazard at that point. They're not going to be, it evaporates so fast. It's not a repellent. And the only use is to actually drown the bed bug and kill them in rubbing alcohol. I had a, I just saw a presentation from a 
grad student in at Ohio State who experimented and she sprayed bed bugs in a lab with rubbing alcohol and it was she said it was as if they got drunk passed out and then a couple hours later they were up and walking again so don't rely on rubbing alcohol and please share that with clients too because um, what we see are people trying to self-treat with rubbing alcohol and if they're smokers or um, you know there's other sparks in the apartment it could be an extreme fire hazard and this happens once in a while where someone sets lights fire to their entire home because they've used uh, rubbing alcohol and then they're trying to heat the bed bugs with their um, with their oven open so big safety concern there not a good way to uh, protect yourself so thank you for that question okay so the other thing i do is use these plastic totes i'll show you in the next slide what i'm talking about but when I've had a long day at work and I'm just like, I can't, can't, <laughs> I just gotta, I can't inspect all my stuff that I carried with me. I put my work stuff in a plastic tote and I close it up and I deal with it the next day. As long as it's contained, they can't get out. I can delay having to inspect and go through all that work stuff. So if you like, for example, if you carry around papers with you or um, items that you're bringing from home to home, um, just be aware that Anywhere, anything you set down could pick up a, a hitchhiker. Vacuuming regularly, I mentioned, and monitors. So if you have, um, if you have monitors, or if you have an office where people are coming in and you're concerned, you can. I'll talk about monitors. You can put monitors in your in your office. Um, I have monitors in my home because I'm exposed to bed bugs all the time. So I put monitors right next to my bed. And that will give me a clue if I get an infestation faster. So when you're, um, th these are good tips for you, but also for your clients. Uh, keep backpacks, coats, purses, bags off of anything upholstered. Hang it up, bring it to the kitchen, don't set it on the couch. Um, inspect furniture carefully before bringing it home. This is a message for your clients or even yourselves. If you're buying used furniture, really inspect it. Use that lint roller and a flashlight. Always look for signs when sleeping away from home. I think most hotels have gotten better about inspecting, but you never know. So I always pull the mattress back and I look at the box spring. Um, and then the other thing that kills bed bugs before you even know you have an infestation sometimes is just washing the bedding because they're going to be in the bedding at first. And if we change um, sheets and bedding regularly, that should kill them as well. And then I already mentioned that's my smooth plastic tote where I keep my work stuff. And the totes can contain infested stuff or keep clean stuff from being infested. Uh, areas for at risk for introduction and infestation, where people frequently travel, where they set their belongings down, or they sit down for long periods of time. So you can't really get a uh, hitchhiker unless you're sitting down for a few minutes. They are not going to approach somebody real fast. They're going to wait till they know that there's no movement and they sense the CO. You're breathing out CO2 and you're staying very still. They will come out then, but they're not going to just make a beeline towards you the moment that you walk into a, a home. They can only crawl, so they have to, they're limited in where they can get to. Um, and they like to hide in the cracks and folds. Um, so right now, bed bugs are really established. So if you have a client with bed bugs, it's likely they know somebody and they visited somebody and they bounce off of one another. Um, or they're living in an apartment and the neighbor has an infestation. So they're they're really well established um, and it's usually visitors or just travel through buildings that that end up spreading infestations. So the big message I want to share is early detection is the key. We can kill bed bugs. We know how to kill bed bugs uh, early on in the infestation. Most of them are going to be around the bed and the sofa um, as you get into more advanced uh, infestations, they spread. So now only 44% are on the bed and sofa and 56 have spread through to other harborages, which makes them a lot harder to treat. So an, an infestation that's caught early should be totally eliminated in two to three treatments. An infestation that has spread 
far past out of the bed is going to take five or more treatments and that's more chemical exposure to the, the people that are affected. We can't really rely on complaints because a lot of people don't report because they're afraid that they're uh, charged, they'll be charged or evicted. They're embarrassed. They're unaware of the signs. A lot of elderly and disabled folks that in apartments I visit don't even know that they have bed bugs. They can't see them. They're not getting impacted by the, the bites. Um, and they're small. And most of the elderly and disabled housing I visit, they just don't know they have them and they don't react to the bites. So how do we know if there is a bed bug infest in, infestation in those circumstances? You have to use monitors. Um, sticky traps aren't the most effective monitor for bed bugs. These little passive traps that are just essentially moats. You can make your own out of little recycled smooth plastic containers. Um, they can detect up to 95% of infestations, just like the sticky traps for cockroaches. They um, can be there all the time. So when I'm doing an inspection, I'm only there for a few minutes, but a passive or an active monitor is there 24-7 uh, collecting information for you. So the most effective monitors on the market are these climb up interceptors. They're smooth on the inside. The bed bug gets trapped in there. I'll show you another picture to explain it. The bed bugs get trapped in there and they can't climb out. They're not good at climbing smooth plastic surfaces. The other um, monitor that I put on the bottom um, is the volcano, the Sensai volcano, and that has a little lure in it that's supposed to smell like human sweat. Um, so you don't want to stick your face right in there, but it's not that offensive. I have those in my bedroom right now. Uh, there are other monitors out there, but those are the ones that we see working the best. Um, but certainly ask me questions if you have questions about monitors. So there's two types of inspections. So when we're looking at a home, we think maybe infested. Um, if you know where to look and know the signs, you can do a quick inspection. Uh, and when I'm working with public housing, I encourage the staff to do the quick first inspection because it's a matter of getting, uh, addressing the problem right away. We don't want that person that called the office and said, I think I have bed bugs to wait more than 24, 48 hours. So I encourage when I'm working with housing staff, I encourage them to learn how to do the quick inspection. So that quick inspection is just to confirm, yes, there is an infestation. No, I don't see an infestation here before a professional comes in. And you only have to inspect the beds and sofas only. You ask the person, where do you sleep? And you inspect that um, item. Or did you just recently buy this recliner <laughs> or get it off the street? Then you only inspect that item and look for the signs, the, the fecal spots and the shed skins. So you focus on the easy bed bug si signs and that could take you five minutes. Um, they're, the, they're faster than a detailed inspection. I'm gonna clarify the difference in a sec. If you go into a home and the person says, I think I have bed bugs, you look around the bed. Um, you don't have to take apart the entire bed. You can kind of just uh, take a flashlight, look around the seams, uh, pull back the, the blankets um, and check really quickly. If you're suspicious and there's no live bed bugs found, you leave those interceptor traps. A professional inspection is different. What a professional is trying to do is find every last bug so they know where to put the chemicals because the chemicals, in order for the chemicals to work, they have to be where the bugs are. So when bed bugs are hiding in a bunch of clutter and they don't come in contact with the chemicals that the pest control technicians sprayed, they won't die. So the professional inspection has to be super thorough. The one thing I always tell uh, my clients I work with is the housing sites is if they're coming in, a professional's doing an inspection in five minutes, they're not doing enough. They want to, you want that person to be there for a long time, inspecting every little nook and cranny of a home. So there's two ways they can do that is a visual inspection with a flashlight as my friend here is doing or a scent detecting canine. Uh, if you, they find bed bugs, they're always gonna, they should, um, inspect the neighboring room or if it's an apartment situation, the neighboring uh, unit. So check the adjacent units and across the hall in high-rise apartment buildings. 
canine inspections. Um, if you have questions on this, talk to me. They're relatively fast. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. They're good for uniform scent places, meaning like a library. It kind of all smells the same. Uh, but in homes, there's so many competing scents, it's a little more challenging. So like a bust would be a great place. Uh, library, a movie theater would be a great place for a canine to inspect, but homes is a little more challenging because there's a lot of competing scents and uh, their noses only go so high. So if the bed bugs have moved up to the ceiling, which they often do, you might not get, they might not alert. Um, there's also very big um, difference in the quality of the inspections. So uh, yeah, th this is a whole class in and of itself. So if you have questions about canine inspections, I invite you to uh, talk to me about it. Why should we inspect the neighboring units? Well, because bed bugs are always wandering and traveling. So um, what I, when you were, if you're working in high rise buildings, the neighbor, if one unit is infested and the infestation has moved outside the bed, then it's likely that it's spread to neighboring apartments. But often pest control companies might charge to treat those neighboring apartments before they inspect. So what I encourage is they should be inspected but not treated unless you find evidence of bed bugs. If there's no evidence of bed bugs found in the neighbors, then uh, those monitors should be left behind. And depending on the construction of the home or the building, uh, you know, you have to, the pest control technician should use their judgment as far as how they think the bed bugs have spread. But people should never pay or be charged for treatment if they, if no bed bugs were found. I've come in contact with uh, a couple places where they were heat treating the neighboring units, but we didn't even know if they had bed bugs and that's very expensive. So it, if there's chemicals applied, you know, sometimes a Technician will will spray a barrier treatment in a neighboring home, a neighboring unit, um, just to prevent the bed bugs from spreading. That's that's pretty reasonable. That's uh, acceptable. Okay, well, if you have someone that finds a bed bug, what we want them to do is save the insect, put it in a baggie, put it in a pill jar. Um, I like to say put it in a stick it to a piece of tape and fold the tape over and then it's confined then put it in your baggie and then you want that person to hold on to that bug so it can be verified and uh, confirmed that it is a bed bug. Uh, when I work with public housing it's very easy I say call the manager call the management office and tell them you have bed bugs and then keep that in your apartment don't bring it to the office we don't want them to do that but um, we want them to save the bug so then the management can say, okay, we'll schedule a treatment. Uh, with, with situations you guys work in, it's, granted, it's a lot more complicated than that, but they should still save the insect as proof. They should report the problems to their landlord. Um, a lot of people are afraid they'll be evicted or charged. That's a, a big problem when you're working outside of public housing. Uh, they we don't want them to disturb the area and start moving things around. Uh, if they're going to get a professional to treat it, we don't want them to disturb the area, push the bed bugs around, apply pesticides. We want the professional to be able to inspect, find the bugs, and then apply their chemicals. We, um, we should discourage people from discarding furniture because that's really just spreading it through the community. So I find them on my nightstand. I put it out on the, the street because I don't want the bed bugs or I put my mattress out on the street. It's very likely someone will pick those up and that's another way that they spread. <clears throat> so yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about advocating for, for clients and for working with people that don't have access, that don't live in public housing and don't have access to uh, professional treatment. So I'm just gonna briefly, well, let me check the time. Woo. We're almost at an hour. So uh, very briefly, I'm gonna just review uh, or just tell you the integrated pest management for bed bugs starts with education and awareness, pest proofing, sanitation, physical controls like heat, mechanical controls like encasements and vacuums, and then finally pesticides. So all these play a role in treating for bed bugs and all treatments should include a little bit of everything. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on working with residents because I really want to uh, focus on that next week. We want to uh, just communicate a couple messages to your clients. Um, if they have a landlord that provides the treatment, great. 
we'll talk about alternatives if they have a landlord that doesn't provide treatment or if they own their own home. Um, we'll talk about that, you know, some solutions for that next week. But in general, I try to let people know that they should inspect and they should report if they find them. Don't self-treat, don't throw out furniture, don't pick up discarded furniture and do your laundry regularly and vacuum if you can. Uh, I've had, I, I encourage classes for residents. This isn't maybe your, your role, but uh, the more we talk about it, the better things are because people feel more comfortable talking about bed bugs if we're talking about them. And then there's all sorts of posters and brochures that have information, but often um, there are situations where one-on-one -on -one intervention is needed. And uh, that can be for elderly and disabled people, that could be for a hoarding situation, that could be for people that are self-treating and using ineffective chemicals, bug bombs, for example. So there's a couple of resources I have on my website to communicate messages with, with folks and I encourage you to visit stoppest.org and look under the resident printed resident materials for some of these easy to follow picture based guides. PrEP uh, is a big controversial topic among bed bug control. Right now there's a push among the professional community to do less preparation. And you all know when your clients have bed bugs, it is a really difficult thing when they give, uh, the pest control company gives the, the resident like a two page list of things that they have to do before the professional even comes. So what the idea with limited prep is that the unit or the home is inspected first, the technician, the pest control guy, uh, finds the bugs and then gives very specific preparation instructions based on where they're finding the bugs. So if they're only in one room, why does the entire house have to be, you know, turned upside down and bagged and, and all that? So low to moderate infestations mean there should be less prep. High level infestations, yeah, then you need to do everything. We want to encourage a community response. If you see uh, bed bugs occurring in your community outside, you know, and they're just getting bounced around, a lot of communities have um, bed bug commissions set up or bed bug task force to kind of address the uh, bed bugs in the community on a community level because often it is a community level problem. There's they're just bouncing off one uh, home to another. And especially when you have high rise buildings that are infested or um, hotels that are infested, they're gonna keep, uh, keep the bed bugs in the community. So we want everyone to be educated. We wanna destroy discarded items so our neighbors don't pick up those uh, infested items. And then there's gotta be a way to reduce financial burdens um, in my particular community in uh, Tompkins County, New York, there is a healthy homes program that gives uh, residents that have are low income people that have bed bugs, they give them mattress encasements and monitors. So think creatively about how we could get some of these resources to to people. There's grants available. Um, but they often it often takes a you know community getting together and saying, okay, we have problems here. So when I work with a housing site, I encourage like a public housing authority to provide the mattress encasements for the residents, to provide the monitors, and then help with uh, furniture removal if needed, because sometimes it is. So what should the property manager or the landlord do in these situations? And I know that some of your clients are not going to have success with this, but in an ideal world, they would be inspecting and monitoring every, every home, every unit that they manage at least once a year. Um, they would identify focus areas because often in a high rise building, there's just one unit that is the source for the rest of the building because they spread so easily. So we really, if we can conquer that, um, that badly infested unit, then it's gonna control a lot of the spread. And then they should be monitoring and doing the evaluation. Is this working? Looking at the records of uh, how many times that unit has been treated and what they've been doing. But often this doesn't happen and that's why I exist <laughs> or my job exists. We also in uh, 
public housing situations or Section 8, there's a contract and the managers of those buildings should be overseeing the contract, allocating the time and the resources and using renovation and unit turnover as an opportunity. I know some of you might be involved in um, renovations. So what could be done at a renovation? Well, dusting wall voids, dusting under carpets. If you're removing carpets is a great way to prevent pet bugs because once they get under the carpet, they're really hard to treat. So using those opportunities. Oh, this is a picture of that stupid cove base. Um, this apartment was, uh, the infestation was uh, coming from uh, behind the cove base there. The resident had eliminated all their furniture. They were sleeping on the floor and management needed to peel back that cove base and address the issue with the bed bugs behind it that resident was pouring boiling water <laughs> behind the cove base. And some of that is bed bug droppings, but some of it's mold from the resident trying to use boiling water to control their own issues. So not the best. I can't see this picture. Um, oh yeah, so I'm just peeling. By the way, I should be wearing gloves there. Um, I didn't talk about that in personal protection, but bed bugs eat blood and that is a bodily fluid. We shouldn't be, don't, don't do this, what I'm doing there is you, without gloves. Uh, contractors, good contractors are out there, um, but some, when we're not providing oversight and we're not advocating for good control, um, sometimes they cut corners or they just spray pesticides and they don't do all the other things that need to be done. So if uh, you're ever in the position to be hiring somebody to control bed bugs, um, there's Texas A&M fact sheet goes through the process of how to find a good contractor. That's all I want to say. So another, um, just for you to advocate for your clients, you have to know what are the best treatment options. Um, I talked about vacuuming and the importance of that. Isolation, meaning in mattress encasements, you can keep you can wash your clothes, keep them in clear bags, and they will stay uninfested. Closed plastic containers, making the bed an island, that can provide immediate relief for somebody. If we can eliminate the bed bugs on the bed, move the bed away from the wall, not have anything hanging down, and also using those uh, bed bug interceptor traps if there's legs on the bed, um, you can actually provide immediate relief for a client that is getting, you know, eaten alive every night. So if you have questions on that, there's a picture-based fact sheet on the website that shows you how to make the bed an island. Freezing is a low, um, is a DIY method that isn't as reliable as heat. I would recommend heat, but freezing, say a book or DVDs that, that there's no other way to treat them, you can put them in the freezer for four days set at zero. Heat is really the Achilles heel of bed bugs. Um, clothes dryer is a tool that a lot of us have access to, and I use it certainly a lot to uh, disin or to uh, treat my clothing after I leave an apartment that has been uh, has an infestation. Steam uh, container whole unit. I'll, I'll show you some pictures of these, and then finally pesticides. There's sprays and dust. Mattress encasements. We want to vacuum up the visible bed bugs before we put them on, cover any sharp points, seal up that um, mattress and the box spring if they can afford it. If you can only afford, if a client can only afford one mattress encasement, cover the box spring because that has a lot of cracks and crevices where the bed bugs can hide more so than a mattress. Uh, leave it on for a year. So the idea is if there were any eggs or bed bugs that got trapped in there, they can't feed and they will die. Bed bugs probably only live about six months without a blood meal, but we always say a year because we're not quite sure. Um, and then it can eliminate, using these mattress encasements can eliminate the need to throw your to throw a mattress out. We When we work with low-income clients, we don't want them to throw out their mattress because it's really expensive to replace and like I mentioned earlier, I see too many people sleeping on the floor thinking, oh, well, I'll control the bed bugs just by throwing out my furniture. And that doesn't work because they're, the, they're in the walls, they're in the cove base. Heat, um, there's several types of heat. This uh, 
building staff we worked in Pennsylvania bought this zap bug portable heat chamber that they treated cribs and wheelchairs with and they just took this it's like a tent that they assembled uh, in every apartment that was infested they could treat the recliners but that's an investment that's a uh, what do they cost like fifteen hundred dollars to buy one of those with the heaters and the tent um, some uh, groups that I've worked with actually county groups bed bug task force groups have purchased these zap bugs and they loan them out or they uh, have like a rental that they that they provide so it's in the community and others can use these uh, heat chambers whole unit heat treatment that's when they bring the heater into the home and they heat treat the entire home that's great but we're finding that it's not 100 percent effective just like chemicals because the bed bugs can find places to hide where they're not hit by the heat like in the walls or deep down in a couch cushion the heat might not get there so the best treatment we're finding is the whole unit heat treatment combined with a residual chemical so if you miss some during the heat treatment they'll eventually hit the chemical and kill them steam is really a great heat treatment because it's effective and it's accessible to anybody who can buy a steamer i have a 20 dollars steamer that if i ever got bed bugs i would put to use the uh, they work just as well as an industrial size steamer, but you have to replace the water pretty frequently. So that might be a, an option for some clients that cannot afford uh, professional treatment um, to get a steamer. The clothes dryer, like I mentioned, is an amazing tool for treating bed bugs. And in this picture, that's a rug in an industrial size uh, uh, dryer. So. You can uh, use the dryer pretty effectively to control bed bugs. Oh, and my can you offer free laundry or one machine designated for bed bugs? That that's more for uh, property management to help their residents. Steam, I mentioned, it's slow. It takes a long time. Has a professional doing it. Penetrates the cracks and crevices, and it kills all life stages, even the eggs. Chemicals don't kill eggs, so steam does. It's great, but there's no residual, so uh, once that steaming is done, the bed bugs can come back. Pesticides, I'm just going to be brief on what you should know about pesticides. Only the professionals should use them. There's several different form formulations. There's no silver bullet. Like I said, every, bu every bug becomes resistant to every chemical we throw at them. Sorry. <laughs> Pesticide sprays have limited residual effect and some only work on contact, like the raid that me or you could buy. You actually have to hit the bug. So as much as we can spray that around, we're going to miss the bugs and it's not going to be 100% effective. And often those sprays just push the bed bugs further into hiding. So it makes it really harder to treat if they're using sprays. Most effective chemicals are the ones that are available to professionals that we can't access, and that's a neonicotinoid pyrethroid combination. Dusts are very effective, and if you have a client that has professional treatment, there should be a, a dust that is applied um, perhaps under the box spring, perhaps in the wall voids, but dusts are really effective as long as they stay dry. And you can ask me about um, efficacy of different products. What's not effective are these products that uh, this person obviously picked up at the grocery store or hardware store because of all the reasons I already mentioned. They expose us to more chemicals, they don't work, and they push the bed bugs around probably into neighboring units. A professional should do thorough inspection, site-specific prep, and returns every two weeks. You want them to keep coming back. Bed bugs are never, ever controlled in just one visit because the chemicals do not kill the eggs. So even a heat treatment, you know, that can work in one, one treatment, but there should be a professional that comes back in two weeks to inspect. What if there's control failure? Oh, before I go on, this is a picture of how these monitors work. So the bed bugs travel from outside the bed. They get caught in this outer well. If they're coming down the leg, they get caught in the inner well, and that can tell you where the infestation is coming from. So what if uh, treatment isn't working? We want to make sure that the pest control technician, if there is one, has used a vacuum. 
Have they used monitors? Have they spent enough time? If they're just spending 5, 10, 15 minutes in a home or an apartment, that's not enough time. It, bed bug work is consuming work. It is has to be done thoroughly. And then the other thing we need to consider is how do we communicate with the residents? What messages do we need to give them? Well, one of the things is they need to, to maybe clean up the items that are under their bed. And then the other thing to ask the pest control company is, have they rotated products? Are they just relying on the same chemical over and over and it's not working? Then we need to advocate for some better uh, control. So the IPM method for bed bugs is essentially to mix it up, use heat, use pesticides, and vacuums and encasements are really important. Mattress encasements can cost anywhere from 20 to $120. Um, anything is better than nothing. Even a vinyl uh, mattress cover that's really cheap, less than $20 can work. The, the problem is it might rip easier. So let's just review. This is what I use when I'm talking to, to buildings, but you can kind of think it through in the cases that you've worked with. Um, who's doing educating the person with bed bugs? Is there any monitoring happening? What are we expecting uh, from preparation? What about elderly and disabled people who can't do the prep? What happens then? Does this person have access to laundry? Are there mattress encasements available for free or for at cost somehow? Um, who's doing the visual inspection? If there's furniture that needs to be removed, who does that? Who's reviewing records? Like if you, I'm assuming you guys are working with just individual clients, um, ask them, well, how many times have you had to have this uh, home treated? How many times? And if it's over six, that's a red flag that that's not working, right? Uh, and then things to consider asking the pest control company, are there monitors? Are they using monitors? Do they inspect neighboring units? Do they do assessment-based preparation instructions? Do they use multiple tools? And do they follow up every two weeks and confirm elimination? Confirming elimination means they're visiting at least two or three times and there have been no bed bugs. Often the pest control company doesn't do this and it's up to uh, an inspector or the resident themselves to keep looking and keep inspecting. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure we can pull up the last poll, but um, it would be helpful if you guys can let me know in the chat if any of the information has helped you improve how you will deal with bed bugs at work. And I'm gonna, oh, it's still the same poll from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's um so it's yeah so it's not if you scroll down to number four those are the questions again will today's training improve or change how you do uh, okay and then yes a little yes a lot no not at all okay so yeah if you can answer number four you might have to answer the other questions to be able to submit it oh it just appeared it's, sorry oh, okay I, that's sorry uh, well let's let's say the you know, we have a small enough crowd that if you want to give me feedback individually, oh, here it is again. Yeah. So you can uh, answer the questions again and hit submit. Um, on the screen right now, I'll just mention is my website with all these resources. Uh, I know that a lot of my material is for public and Section 8 housing, and that's not necessarily that type of housing that you guys work in but a lot of this can apply to your situation, especially um, the working with residents section. Oh, I somehow took that off. Okay. So um, Colleen, I, we could probably close the poll and yeah. if um, you wanna show the results, you can, but uh, we don't have to, but we can take questions at this time. Let's see what time it is. I'm a little over an hour. I think we had left some time for questions. Yeah, so let me see. So how often do you see uh, rodent infestations? Frequently, one, uh, sometimes. Let's see, the, what I had here from the chat was I had four said sometimes, one said never, and two said rarely. Okay. okay. And then we had four people answer 
that they felt that the yes this this will change how we do our work yes a lot or or answer. okay all right thank you for that that helps me in my reporting to say the information is useful <laughs> Uh, does anybody have any questions? You could probably just unmute yourself or put it in the chat. You know, the one thing that I did learn, I uh, just wanted to comment and Rachel and um, Ethel, you could probably and Carmen would have been able to comment on that. So we provide mattress protectors and pillow protectors. Um, we were really thinking of that, of course, as an asthma trigger because of dust. Um, mm -hmm. But the fact that you said that with bed bugs, they really need to have a cover on the box spring too. And that we haven't been providing that, have we, Rachel? No, no, just the mattress cover. Yeah, yeah I, I, that's better than nothing. Um, I would say for allergies and asthma, you want to cover the mattress. So uh, depending on the client, uh, use your best judgment it's expensive to do both the box spring and the mattress yeah um i'd say a lot of people i work with just have a mattress on the floor um so uh you know great put the mattress encasement then on on that mattress if you do have clients that just have mattresses on the floor i want to mention those little cup uh interceptor traps you just place next to the head side against the wall of the bed they even make some that are like square shaped that can fit right in that little uh, corner and i don't have bed legs on my bed so i have those interceptor traps placed next to the head side of my bed because bed bugs are attracted to the heat and your body scent and the co2 and they tend to climb up surfaces that are uh, vertical so on their way to finding me they're going to hit that trap and fall into that that trap i also have some of the volcano traps that i showed with a little lure in them the problem with those is you have to replace the lure every three months which i have forgotten to do i'm sure but just those little volcano traps themselves are attractive to bed bugs because if you put them next to the bed, they're going to climb up that thinking, oh, I'm going towards food and uh, they're going to fall in there and not be able to get out. It's the smooth plastic on the inside that traps them. Mm. So if you want to protect yourself, those are two good options. And I, like I mentioned, I have mattress encasements because I don't I love my mattress. I don't ever want to have to get rid of it. <laughs> Does anybody it's else have questions? Get a mattress uh, protector than it is to get a new, new mattress. <laughs> mm -hmm. And anything is better than nothing. Like I see a lot of people that keep the plastic on. That's not a bad idea. Bed bugs don't like plastic. Um, they can still get into if there's holes and stuff. They'll still get in. They'll find a way. But they're going to tend to hide out on rougher surfaces like wood. Uh, fabric so not a bad idea to keep the plastic on if there's a an issue it's a cheap way to do a mattress encasement yeah i was going to say the box spring certainly could leave the plastic on that just with the mattress it, the plastic might not be very breathable mm -hmm. so you can probably sweat a little bit more um with that um but yeah, no, I appreciate uh, the information. I'm gonna start considering spraying myself with some some bug spray for fleas and bed bugs um, because you know some people don't know they have them, mm -hmm. um, and it's just you know. And you said citronella will work, so I, I mean I don't have to use off. I'm gonna spray my clothes, and uh, I try not to sit down a lot of people's homes. Um, I mean, I'm on the move anyway, so, you know, but some of the process is in an interview, you know, so I do talk to the client a little bit before, um, and sometimes they offer me, uh, you know, somewhere to sit. Um, but I would imagine, you know, hard surfaces are better, just like, you know, a wooden chair mm -hmm. is probably a safer, you know, I've done that for years because of my cat allergies, so. I usually don't sit on people's upholstery anyway. Yeah. Because um, it could be where the cat hangs out when I'm not there. Um, 
and then I start getting triggered. So, um, but yeah, thank you. That's a One good of point, my... CJ. Uh, excuse me, there's a good point, CJ, because Rachel, I know you you and Carmen recently had that situation last month and, uh, and uh, where she was sitting on the hard chair and then the client wanted you to sit on the sofa that wasn't too clean. So, yeah. So, yeah. and it's part, it was part of the interview process as well. So it's things to be aware of. One of my friends goes into, uh, goes into homes frequently and he takes a newspaper uh, with him. He sits on the newspaper and tends to meet in the kitchen on, you know, non-upholstered chairs, but he'll sit on the newspaper. And when he leaves, he doesn't bring that newspaper back with him. So the idea is if a bed bug did climb up the chair, it's going to look for the first little nook and cranny that it could get into. And that would be the newspaper. So he uh, thinks that that helps. Bed bugs, I don't know if I mentioned, when we're in apartments and homes during the day, bed bugs are not generally out during the day. And if you're moving like an inspector or like a pest control technician, and you're not, you know, sitting down for more than five minutes, the chances of you bringing home a bed bug are very low. The chances increase when you have clients coming to your office and sitting on upholstered chairs for periods of time. Um, and the chances of you bringing them home also increase when the infestation is very heavy and you have, they have, eventually they run out of places to hide and they just kind of start wandering around. We're not really sure why they wander around, but if you see them during the day, that is a bad infestation because generally they want to be hiding until it's nighttime and quiet and nobody's moving. The other question nobody asked is what about pets? Yes, I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> so um, they won't generally uh, stay on pets. Their body shape, think about the shape of a flea as opposed to a bed bug. Fleas are made for navigating through fur. Bed bugs are not. They like smooth skin. They're adapted for you know, feeding on humans. So occasionally if there's a bad infestation, your pet might get bitten on their belly or where there's less fur, but they're not gonna stay on the pet. They might stay in the pet's bedding though. So that should be addressed. I'd like to ask you about the children. If there's a young person, I mean, a child that um, is infected with uh, bed bugs, can they transpose it to another child? You know, like at school? Yeah, schools are an, a, an issue and every school has to develop their own policy, but um, it, transmission is unlikely in schools because there's less places for them to hide. There's less upholstered um, areas. We, um, the recommendations that we have uh, for schools is if a child has an infestation at home, not keeping them out of school until the infestation is taken care of, because as you know, that could be months, but to have provide a change of clothes for that child and provide one of those tubs for the child to put their belongings in. So let's think about if a kid came to school and we didn't know they had bed bugs and they were on that child's clothing. The bed bug, um, if it wandered off the child's clothes and say was on, on the chair overnight, they're not gonna reproduce or really have much luck. Uh, an infestation is very unlikely because there's nobody there at night to feed on. Where you might have an infestation is if a teacher had a, a sofa or something in their classroom and then there were children sitting on the sofa for a long period of time or an upholstered area. Then the other scenario is they're on the child's backpack. Well, if they're on the backpack, mm -hmm. yeah, they could wander off, but in general, they're gonna stay put during the day and just start wandering at night. So there's very low transmission there. Um, and well, okay, the bed bug travels off the backpack. Where are they gonna go? They're probably gonna hide somewhere until they um until it's, until it's dark so there is a very low risk of transmission at schools there's nothing to eat at schools at night so the population won't explode like it does in people's homes thank you but providing that extra that change of clothes perhaps to a child like this is the school's responsibility the school has to 
you know, find a place for that backpack, change the clothes, or have a dryer where the clothes could be treated and returned to the kid. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Transmission is more likely on buses, movie theaters, libraries, and doctor's offices, and visiting. Mainly it's visiting. When I find, you know, when we're doing these, like, it's almost like um, detective work when you're trying to figure out where, why does this person keep getting infested? You know, they're, they're, it, it's often that they have a, a visitor that comes frequently or they're visiting somewhere else and they're just bouncing off of one another. That's why it's a community problem. <laughs> well, hopefully you're not freaked out more than <laughs> when we started and hopefully some of these tools will help. And if you have a client that has no access to professional treatment, feel free to talk to me and we'll talk through some of the DIY steps that they could take. It's very hard to control bed bugs without professional treatment, but there are things that they could do um, that I could talk through with you. Yeah, if you could, I don't know if there's like a, a flyer or just a list maybe that you could provide us and then we could share. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, a lot of the programs were able to to cover that cost, but then we have other programs that does not cover right. that. So at least some, it'd be something to share with the families. Did your pest control technician come on? No, David, it wasn't again. Here I think he's in Nashville having fun. Oh, okay. Um, the, uh, yeah, I, I, I got a good sense that he knows what he's doing uh, just from the brief interaction I had. Um, but always be concerned if the treatment goes on and on and on and on, um, then something's going wrong. Yeah. And it could be the treatment or it could be, you know, like a visitor coming back and forth that we didn't anticipate. Or it could be a neighboring unit. Sometimes if you're not aware of what's next door, mm -hmm. it's almost impossible. Uh, I have pro had professionals tell me that they, the row houses are <laughs> some of the hardest uh, uh, places to treat because if you own your own row house, um, there's no landlord. There's, you know, that professional can't get into the neighboring unit we don't know if that neighboring home has the bed bugs and they're just transferring them. So it's challenging. That's for sure. Well, maybe if uh, next week, uh, if we get David on, maybe we can always follow, do a follow-up question with him then. Yeah. So yeah, I'm really supposed to say professional, 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 but the reality is I encounter people in my own community where they're never going to be able to afford a professional treatment. So what are some options that we can give them? We can talk about that next week when we talk a little bit more about working with residents. Oh, perfect. Okay. Very are there good. any other questions? If some of you are having trouble with your audio, if you want to type in a question on the chat, I can read that. Okay. <laughs> So, um, um, I'm always available. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to be sharing um, the links. Um, I've been uploading them to the Revitalized CDC YouTube site. If you, if you want to go there before I distribute all of these links, you can go to uh, the RevitalizedCDC.com uh, website. At the Scroll down to the bottom, there's an icon for our YouTube page. Click on that, and it should be the latest video popping up there. And then we've got to figure out how we're going to share the slides too, because they are rather large files. So, um, but we'll, 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 we'll figure something out here. We'll probably do it all at the end once we complete all three sessions so that if somebody missed a session, they can go back and watch it or somebody wants to revisit something just to double check, you can do that too. So. Yeah, if somebody wants a copy of the presentation, we'll have to figure out how to share it. Um, I can do a PDF, but I can also post it on my website and share a link too. So let me know if you okay. like that. Okay. Yeah, I think that would that would be helpful. Okay. Um, well, yeah, you can wait till we're done with the next week. So. All right. Two, Sounds two good. Third, two thirds of the way completed. All right. <laughs> yeah. So if you were going to join us next week for working with residents, um, 
come with uh, questions and specific scenarios that we can talk through. There's no easy answers, but um, I'll try to share what I've learned from the work that I've done. Yeah, this might be a good session, for, especially for a lot of interaction, uh, because mm -hmm. people can share kind of their experiences. And Carla commented, mm -hmm. so thank you for the material, very informative as always. Yeah. So that was nice. Thank you, Carla. Okay, thanks, Carla. So, um, yeah, I think, I think if that's it, um, we're pretty much all set at this point. Uh, follow up with me if you have any questions that I can also relay to Susanna. Uh, you have her email there too. You can contact her directly and um, I look forward to seeing everybody next week. Okay. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye -bye. All right. Thanks. Have a good day. Stay dry. Thank you.